Good morning. Well, after that energetic neurochemical excitation that we just had, you know, it's very interesting that I studied the effect of sex on oxytocin 20 years ago, and I could never get it published. I had four couples who agreed to let me come out and measure their blood levels of oxytocin and prolactin and all of these things before, and I left for 45 minutes, came back, measured them again. And <clears throat> the attitude that people had towards the sex was more important in raising the chemicals than having the sex. Which is, you know, if they were upset over the fact that it was being sort of forced on them, even though they agreed in advance, then they didn't get any oxytocin, they didn't get any prolactin rise, the beta endorphins didn't go up. But if they enjoyed it and weren't worried about it, then it went up, which is, you know, this, we, we know these things are extremely important. Well, I have been studying neurochemistry now for over 30 years. I started looking at it in people with chronic pain, and we found then people with chronic um, depression, which all people with chronic pain have to a greater or lesser extent. And I discovered a number of interesting chemical abnormalities that are not paid attention to very much in most of our patients with any kind of chronic disorder. For instance, all chronically depressed patients have abnormalities of serotonin, norepinephrine, beta endorphin, cholinesterase, melatonin, and their relationships to one another. So I've been interested in this aspect of it for a number of years. And about 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I got interested in DHEA. <clears throat> now, I've always been interested in neurochemistry. If I had not gone into neurosurgery, it would have been endocrinology, because to me, they're really so interrelated. And my first thought was, well, you know, people have their DHEA start to go down by age 30 because of stress. There's this normal relationship between cortisol and DHEA. When you're still healthy, before you begin to burn out, you get that stress reaction that John was talking about, and <clears throat> then your DHEA comes up to help bring it back down, along with the testosterone. Well, we find that most people by age 30 already have lost about 10% of their DHEA. And by age 50, it is way down. And by age 80, the literature confirms that the vast majority of people have 10% or less of what they had at age 30. So I said, well, maybe there's a relationship between cholesterol going up. After all, cholesterol is the foundation for all of these hormones. Maybe there's a relationship between cholesterol and maybe some enzyme gets lost, and that's why we can't make DHEA. Well, women around age 50 stop making mostly progesterone. Now, interestingly, men throughout life make more progesterone than women do after menopause. So I took a group of men who had low levels of DHEA, and I gave them natural progesterone cream. And I said, rub it on the scrotum. It's vascular. Maybe it'll get into the testes a little quicker because some of our DHEA is made there. And lo and behold, they became horny and their DHEA went up. And everybody was happy except one of the wives. And <clears throat> so I got into that. But although it went up, up to 100%, doubled in some men. You know, if you start off at 100 and you're still only at 200 uh, nanograms, you're in trouble still. So I sat down one day and I looked at what else can we do to raise DHEA? And I've, I've done acupuncture since 1967. And so intuitively I felt that if we stimulated the acupuncture points that connect life energy, which is kidneys, with the adrenal glands, with the gonads, with the thyroid, and the pituitary, that it would raise DHEA. So I set up a, a series of 12 acupuncture points which should do that, uh, connecting them through a window of the sky point, and lo and behold, it raised DHEA. And it raised it, whether or not we had already raised it with progesterone, it raised it another 60% and up to 100% in some people. 
So now we had two techniques for raising DHEA naturally. One day I read about methyl sulfonylmethane and how we are deficient in organic sulfur. Now well, that's interesting. So I gave my first group of subjects a gram of uh, MSM, actually you know, one gram of MSM, and half of them had a rise in DHEA and the other half did not. And of course, it was obvious that they had to be a cofactor. The ones who had a rise were already taking vitamin C. So I learned that vitamin C will not raise DHEA by itself, MSM will not raise DHEA by itself, but the two together will raise DHEA. So we had a third technique. Well, about the same time I started working with uh, DHEA, I also began looking at magnesium because not only does DHEA go down as we mature, but magnesium deficiency is rampant throughout the world. 80% of all people are deficient in uh, magnesium in, in this country. It's not absorbed well by the gut. Well, I gave all of my patients for a number of years 10 shots IV, two grams magnesium chloride in a Myers cocktail uh, daily for two weeks, and it did wonders for a whole bunch of things. But people don't like to have to have 10 IVs. And we began playing around with it, and eventually I learned that magnesium chloride is absorbed through the skin. Magnesium sulfate may be, but very poorly compared to magnesium chloride. So suddenly we had a fourth technique that seemed useful, and I measured DHEA, and it turned out that DHEA went up when we put magnesium chloride on the skin, either soaking your feet in it, soaking in a bathtub with it, spraying it on the skin, and letting it dry. And so over a period of about five years, we developed a number of tools that looked as if all of these would raise DHEA an average of about 60%, or when you put all four of them together, we could raise uh, DHEA about 250% over baseline. Now, why not just give DHEA? Well, when you give DHEA, you no longer have that normal balance between cortisol and DHEA. You've got a steady level from the oral uh, or transdermal application of DHEA itself. So I, I like to restore to the body a natural ability, rejuvenate the body's ability to make its own. And as I worked through these years, I also began to look at some of the other chemicals that are highly deficient in our society. And the next one, and the one that may be equally important to DHEA is calcitonin. The most common cause of death in the elderly is a fracture fractured hip. And of course, their calcitonin level is extremely low. So we found that if we could activate the calcitonin system, we would help prevent osteoporosis or even treat osteoporosis. And then finally, the concept of <clears throat> free radicals. We all know that free radicals are ultimately the problem that cause aging, illness, and eventually death. The average American consumes 3.4 servings of fruits and vegetables combined daily. The recommended minimum is five. There have been a number of studies in which people have been paid to increase their intake of fruits and vegetables, and they go from 3.4 to 3.6.